I'm going to talk to you today about storytelling in the digital age. And a question that we are going to look at carefully is, is everyone with a smartphone a journalist? We are increasingly not just communicating with our smartphones, but we are also using them as our windows to the world. We are consuming news and information on them. We are creating content on our smartphones. We are documenting little things of our lives. And we are putting that content out, our little stories, which range from personal things like, where did I travel? Um, which restaurant did I check into? To um, things of, uh, you know, civic issues of interest, like um, potholes left unattended in the monsoons, which could be potentially hazardous or a garbage dump um, down the street that has been left for weeks by municipal authorities, not been cleared. And if you're in a situation of a flood or an earthquake, it's those visuals of people who are affected by something like that that go up first because journalists will take their time to get there. So smartphones and digital tools make journalism look really easy. But is that the case? I'm going to start with an anecdote. On May 29th, 2007, I found myself driving down early morning to Dosa from Jaipur after we heard reports of police firing on protesters from the Gujar community who were demanding quota. Six people had died and one policeman had also died. And as we were trying to get to this place, we were getting phone calls that the situation is escalating and that the protest is spreading to other parts of the state and uh, it's becoming increasingly tense. I had 300 rupees on me. It looked like a normal morning till we set out for Dosa. And uh, roads were blocked. We were seeing public property being torched by the protesters. We were diverted from the main highway to the inroads where since the road was blocked, we stopped for tea and 300 rupees were spent there. So I had no money on me and um, then I got a call from a part-time friend and a part-time competitor from a rival news network telling me that do not go to the place where uh, the Gujar leader, Colonel Vesla, is camping with the bodies of those who had been killed because that place is extremely tense and could get violent any time. Before I could process that and basically I would do what I would, we were at Patoli which was ground zero on the highway with uh, Colonel Vesla on the side with the bodies of those who had been killed and 30,000 protesters who had virtually taken control of 50 kilometers of the highway with no sign of police there. They came and surrounded our car. They started shaking it, daring us to get down. I saw some elderly people there, so I called out to them and I spoke to them, I said, we are journalists, we are here to tell your story, and it worked, and we got access. We were able to speak to the leader who was going to decide the future course of action, and we were able to speak to the families of those who were affected, people who were killed. And it was a long day of reporting at Dosa, and by the end of it, we thought, okay, we are done with this, and we were headed to Jaipur. The road was blocked, we couldn't head back. That night, I had to stay in a Dhaba extension, in a room that was the size of a cubicle, which I was lucky to get all for myself. And that night, this quote, which has been one of my favorite quotes, truly made sense to me. And it goes, wherever you find hundreds of thousands of sane people trying to get out of a place and a little bunch of madmen struggling to get in, you know, the latter are newspaper men. So this is from 1930s. And I have my little correction there for newspaper men because to include us who are television and digital journalists and of course to uh, make a gender neutral news people it should be but this was the Gujar Kota agitation in 2007 which made that quote make sense to me so besides that madness that puts you in these situations where everyone else is trying to get out of what is it that sets a journalist apart it's social concern empathy for the world around you ethics of journalism. Uh, when you're hearing a story or reading a story that has been put out to you by a journalist, you know that it has been put through the parameters of journalistic ethics, which is important, and objectivity, which you're taught as a journalist. If it's content that's coming from elsewhere, from non-journalists, it could or could not be 
um, potentially uh, something that qualifies for propaganda. It could be uh, something that incites hate. It could be a whole lot of things that need to be guarded against. But coming to this little data file, which shows projections of smartphone users and how they're growing in India, this is from 2012 to 2018 over a period of six years, and the projection for 2018 is 21.5%. Now, this is an area where I feel that the data actually does not probably accurately reflect what one is seeing um, as reality around one, because it's probably growing much faster than that. This is um, another chart which shows there is a belief that smartphone users are mostly young people, but here you're seeing there's a shift in the age group of people in their 40s and 50s are also using smartphones. This is another one which talks about the socioeconomic backgrounds. It's no longer confined to the urban, affluent, and educated. So what is this reach of smartphone, the proliferation and popularity of smartphone and digital media tools doing to things like journalism, to things like intervention? This is an example of a, story, of, of a girl called Mashal Maheshwari. Does that ring a bell? She's a Pakistani Hindu migrant based out of Jaipur. Her parents had to leave Pakistan in an emergency situation. And she scored very well in her class 12. She took admission here in Jaipur. And she could not write her pre-medical test because of citizenship issues. So she spoke to the media. We filed her story. Through mainstream media, you're seeing in this example, and then going to social media, a combination of both, and then how the authorities respond real time, how that is possible. And the Minister for External Affairs saw her interview, wrote to her instantly on Twitter, Mashal, I'm watching you on CNN News 18. Call me on this number. And she called her and got a seat in a medical college. So this is something that enabled real time intervention. While that was top down, there's also bottom up, which is from the people who sometimes enable um, law enforcement in the war against terror, like in this case, which is uh, the Dhaka attack that we saw recently, where the attackers were identified by the friends, their friends on social media first, before the police set out to verify that. There are other examples of this the African-American who was killed recently in the US and his girlfriend then put out a video of the exact sequence of events which then led to a public outcry and a campaign against it. But the space that's truly interesting and promising is the space between smartphone users who are trying to document things and journalism and that space is very meaningfully occupied by platforms like citizen journalism. The network that I come from has been really pushing the envelope for citizen journalism, which is people's participation in journalism. This story is a story that we had done in 2010. This little girl, Pia Chaudhary, was a six-year-old who was subjected to corporal punishment by her teacher. She turned up at school without doing her homework, and the teacher flung her notebook across and it injured her right eye. And that led to permanent loss of sight in her right eye. And her mother was here in Jaipur. She was in Jinjinu, so it got kind of reported late. She was not given any medical attention or aid by the school. The school actually just pretended nothing had happened, and that made things worse. In this case, because her mother was such a strong woman and willing to fight it out, she, she became a citizen journalist with CNN News 18. We traveled with her to Junjunu. We took it up with the school authorities. Two years of several follow-ups and a PIL in the court led to an order by the court which, uh, in which the court directed that the school should apologize to her and give her 15 lakh rupees to her mother for her treatment. Such a vivacious child who was so full of life, refused to call me by any other way other than my first name. And um, this is a story that's close to my heart. Unfortunately, and very tragically, she couldn't survive. And she developed a rare cancer of the eye uh, because of this uh, condition that she had. And she passed away immediately after she was given this money. But what is satisfying is that uh, we were able to garner support for her in 
her mother being able to fight it out with the authorities. And um, at least there was some sense of closure for her mother. While citizen journalism has been a platform that has been available for a while now in interactive storytelling, what is next? The next wave in interactive storytelling is immersive storytelling, which takes you a step further, closer to the story through combination of text, visuals, pictures, maps, podcasts, audio, and what have you. This is an example of that. This is a story, again, that quote about madmen uh, trying to get into a place when everyone else is trying to get out of there. This is a story that we did out of Falodi when it touched 51 degrees, which is the highest temperature ever recorded in, in the country this summer. And this story includes text. If we can scroll down. It includes use of maps. It includes little anecdotes about people, slideshows. This one, for instance, is a slideshow. We can scroll down. Yes, I think that's good. So it includes videos, pictures, maps, and podcasts to take you, to give you a richer experience of what's actually going on. And what is interesting is that it's entirely crafted for your smartphone. What is the next level of immersive storytelling? It's virtual reality storytelling. Virtual reality is something that transports the viewer into the subject's world. It transports you into the scene of action. You're standing right there in the middle of it all, watching it at a 360 degree level. You can turn around, see everything that's going on. Of course, it's best seen with a virtual reality headset, but just to give you this example, this one is a strong example of that. It's called The Displaced. It's a New York Times documentary. It's 11 minute long. I'll show you just a tiny bit of it. But it talks about three children who are caught in a refugee crisis. One is from Ukraine, another one is a Syrian refugee, and yet another one from Sudan. So several stories that I can think of if they're told in virtual reality format could really give you the experience of what people are going through there and evoke the empathy that a journalist tries to evoke through storytelling. Uh, drought reportage, for instance, is one. So if virtual reality puts the viewer into the subject's world, what is the next level? Well, the next level is of experiential storytelling is blurring of the lines between who the viewer is and who the subject is. This is one such report. It again puts the focus on the global refugee crisis. And it begins with the premise that for the next few minutes, your phone is going to be converted into that of a refugee's phone. <laughs>
by smartphones is a win-win. For journalists, it gives us more tools and more material that could be crowdsourced to tell our stories in a richer way. And for people, it is definitely empowering. So the smartphones that we have in our pockets and the digital tools that we are so used to using, uh, perhaps we haven't realized the full potential of it. We can uh, really explore and um, use them in empowering ways. Thank you.